Hello, I'm Faye Jensen, the CEO of the South Carolina Historical Society. Thank you for joining us for this talk. It's the goal of the Historical Society to tell the story of South Carolinians from all walks of life and to enlighten people about the history of our state and nation. Please go to our website at schistory.org to learn about how you can become involved with our mission. Our speaker today is Dr. Richard Porche. A native South Carolinian, Dr. Porche graduated from the College of Charleston with a BS in biology and received his PhD from the University of South Carolina, where he studied field botany. Dr. Porche is Professor Emeritus at the Citadel and is an adjunct full professor in the Department of Biological Sciences at Clemson University. In 1995, he published Wildflowers of the Carolina Low Country and Lower PD, and he is senior author of Wildflowers of South Carolina. He and Sarah Fick published the story of Sea Island Cotton in 2005, and in 2014, he and William Judd published The Market Preparation of Carolina Rice. He is currently working on four books that deal with a wide range of subjects relating to the history and natural landscape of our state. Dr. Porche serves on the board of directors of the Carolina Gold Rice Foundation and the South Carolina Botanical Garden. He is an, a past trustee of the South Carolina Nature Conservancy, the Charleston Library Society, the Waring Historical Library, and the Huguenot Church in Charleston. Please welcome Dr. Richard Porche. All right, navel store, silk, rice, indigo, and sea island cotton. These are five crops that really built the wealth of the low country. So we may not include navel stores as a crop, but it's still a topic or an industry that along with these other crops help produce the wealth of the low country. We'll start with the Longley Pine Forest. When we settled the country, 1670, there were millions of acres of longleaf pine forest. And the valuable product from the forest, the longleaf plant, is crude turpentine, which is a mixture of resin and spiritual turpentine. The resin is a sticky material, and when the oil inside the resin evaporates, you have a very hard resin material remaining. And then the spirits of turpentine are volatile. And here's a slide showing a longleaf pine tree which had been bruised. Here is the <coughs> crude turpentine coming out. And as soon as the oil evaporates, what's left behind is this um, resin, which is very hard. And, and this slide will show you. Now here's a red cocated woodpecker nest. And you can see the cavity up here. And the woodpecker continually pecks the tree to get the crude turpentine flowing out. It prevents, prevents slate, snakes and so forth climbing up the tree. So there's a typical um, natural use of the crude turpentine. Now in the forest, all in the longleaf pine forest, are what we call abandoned tar kills. Here you see this mound that was built back in the 1700s. It's a saucer-shaped depression, maybe 30 or 40 feet across, and in the middle there'll be a sort of a depression up in the middle of it. So that is a remains of a tar kill. So let's look and see what these tar kills did. Now here's what we do. They took pine logs and put them on top of the tar kill, longleaf pine logs. Then they built a wall around it made of clay and um, pine, pine boughs. Then they would set this mass of logs on fire. Now they didn't want a flame, they simply wanted to smolder. And the heat of, would drive the crude turpentine out of the logs. There was a hole in the bottom of the tar kill and a pipe to it and the crude turpentine would flow out and be collected in a barrel on the outside. Now, the crude turpentine in this condition was simply called tar. It got a lot of trash in it. It was very dark. So the crude turpentine here was simply called tar. So that's why it's called a tar kill. Then it took some of the tar. Now, the tar was used to coat 
the ropes of wooden ships. So this is where the naval stores industry came from, the term. So it is to come the tar and put it in a pitch pot. You hear that? A pitch pot. And there you see it's about three feet deep in the ground, lined with clay, and they would set the tar on fire, and the volatile material would burn out, leaving behind that resin. In this case, it was very dark, so they called it pitch. So this is the early industry, 1600s, all up until the 1800s, the tar kills. Generally, this industry ended with the advent of um, metal um, steel, steel ships. So this is the um, naval stores industry. When the Seneca Lakes dried up or went down very low back in 207, it showed the remains of some of the pitch pots. Here you see the bottom of a pitch pot, the sides are gone, but I got calls from people who were roaming the lake shore, asking me what these structures were, so I simply uh, added to this slideshow. Now, working the tar kiln, it took about two to three weeks to get all the tar out of that mass of pine logs. So here you see a scene of the, the people would simply live in the woods for three weeks as they work this tar kill. So it was a very arduous and very hard job. And you can see a <coughs> typical scene there in the low country around a tar kill. Now, later on, they replaced the tar kills with called the cup and gutter. The cup and gutter. So this is the cup here, and here's the gutter and they would simply go in and cut into down to the cambium of the Longley Pond. It'd start down here and keep going up and up and up and up and up and up and up. So you can see where they cut it here and up there. And that would call the crude turpentine to drain out, hit the gutter, and go into the cup. So now we're back to collecting the crude turpentine out of the Longley Pine tree. And then you can see collecting it. Here they're using bucket to collect it. Here they are collecting the crude turpentine and putting it in a barrel, and now they'll take the barrels to the turpentine still. So in there they would take the crude turpentine and heat it up. The volatile spirits of turpentine would evaporate, go into a pipe, condense down. So they're simply separating the resin from the spirits of turpentine. So what was left after you've evaporated the volatile material or the spirits of turpentine, the resin was left behind. So this is a, a more of a modern situation, getting the crude turpentine out of the tree and then distilling it into the spirits of turpentine and the resin. These are two very important products. We still use spirits of turpentine as a paint thinner. And if you play baseball or played baseball, the resin bag, that came from the same process right here. So this was a major industry um, for a couple of hundred years in the low country of South Carolina. And we still have, you can go out in the forest and still see some of the old catfish, we call them a catfish tree. This is on Sandy Island, you can see where they cut into the bark there, so you can see it looks like the face of a cat. So um, I'm working on a landscape book, and we'll probably include a tree like that as part of our cultural landscape. So there's the remains of the turpentine industry in the low country. Now we move to Silk Oak Plantation. You can read that. The home of Daniel Johnson came here in 1644 and he began a silk industry. So early on, the planters who came from Barbados came over here trying to develop some kind of agriculture to make money. Remember Barbados at that period of time, 1670, was so crowded that they had no more room, the planters had no more room for their sons to give them land. So many of them came to Charleston, settled in the area, up in the Goose Creek area, and became what we call the Goose Creek men. But they early on tried a silk industry. There you see the Carolina colony, 1665, roughly when the um, colonists came over. And this was all the land that was granted to the colonists. So many of these people settled in the Goose Creek area and so they became the Goose Creek men. Well, here's a, simply a segment from an article that says, We are laying out in several places of ye world for plants and seeds proper for your country and for sons that are skilled in planting and producing wines, uh, that's vines, mulberry trees, rice, oils, and such other commodities that enrich 
those other countries. So they were trying all kinds of crops to produce a profit over here in the New World. And one of them was silk. And this is the remains of the silk industry. Not much has been written. That's where we were supposed to go last year, and we couldn't, couldn't get there. So there's a silk barn at Silk Oak Plantation. Now, I, I'm not an expert on the silk industry, so I'll just go through this very briefly. But I believe that's the only remains of a silk barn where the worms were kept to turn them in to, turn, or to make the cocoons. So this is very briefly. The white mulberry was a tree that the um, silkworm used as food. The white mulberry was not native. It was brought over here for the silk industry, and it is now, I guess, the dominant mulberry tree around Charleston. It's the white mulberry or Morris alba. So that is what fed the silkworms. And yet, oops. Here's a quick slide of the life cycle. Here we have the moth on the mulberry leaf. This is its food, and it lays its eggs, the native elephant to the larva, still using the mulberry leaf for food. Then the larvas begin to spin the cocoon. So inside you have, and here's the cocoon here. That's all the silk they use. They make the cocoon out of, out of what we call the silk. And then the insect hatches out again into a moth, and the life cycle is repeated. But this is the structure here we're going to use to commercially produce the silk. And there is processing the silk. Inside is the silkworm. Here's a cocoon. I think they put it, or they starve the cocoon for a while to kill the insect inside. Then they boil it in water to sort of free the silk fibers. This is, this is very crude I'm trying to explain to you. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. But once you boil it, you, you free the fibers, the silk fiber, and then you simply unwind it from the cocoon onto a, a wheel, and then you spin it into different kinds of silk fiber. Well, this was the industry. It did not last very long. It couldn't compete with the indigo you'll see next and rice and the cotton later on, but it did provide a source of income for a period of time, but it never really came a, became a major industry, even though um, we, I, I love to want to go back to that barn one day and see what the barn looked like. That photograph I showed you was maybe 60 or 40 years old. So there's briefly the silk injury. Did not last very long because it couldn't compete with indigo. So here we have the native indigo. So now we move on. We've moved from the naval stores. We move from silk. And now we're going to talk about indigo. We have a native indigo, Indigophora caroliniana. That's the native indigo. It does supply some of the dye, but not as much as the indigo we brought in. Indigophora subfruticosa, this is the Guatemalan indigo. This is the plant that started the indigo industry in South Carolina. 1740, Eliza Lucas began the process. She was really, I could market it. She had help trying to actually grow the plants and everything, but still, she's given credit for introducing commercially indigo 1740 into the low country. Now, this is a diagram showing the process of indigo. When I started studying this, I realized that this diagram was wrong. They've got lime water here and a long conduit going all the way over to the beta vat. Didn't work that way. Nobody realizes that. Everybody's used this diagram. But what I had to do was get somebody to Photoshop and we shortened that can do it because what you have here was simply water that went into the fermentation vat. So I've shortened that to use it in a book I'm working on. So let's look at the process here. Now here's something people don't realize. There is no indigo in the plant. There is no indigo in the indigo plant. So let's see why I say that. The leaves are collected here and put into what's called a fermentation vat and they fill up the fermentation vat with water. Bacteria in there begin a chemical process which converts the indican, the, com the com compound in the leaves is something called indican. And the fermentation converts the indican to indoxol. So now we've got a mass of indoxol here, and at the lower part of this fermentation vat, you drain off the liquid with the indoxol into the beta vat. So now we've got the indoxol in the beta vat. 
And what you're going to do is beat that material, that um, compound with the water. Either they've got a series of buckets you can raise or lower, or they use paddles. But what you're trying to do is introduce oxygen into the uh, beta vat, because the oxygen will convert indoxol to indigo. Well, that's what you're trying to do. So the third step, you go from indican to indoxol to indigo. So now you've got a mass of indigo in the beta vat. You add lime water, which precipitates out the indigo, settles to the bottom, and then you drain this indigo mud out at the bottom of this beta vat, and you put it in these little silk bags, you hang it up in silk bags, and the water drops out or drains out. Then you can further dry it over here in a board. And the main thing is you've got to get it as dry as you can. Then you cut it into little cakes, and then you ship it or pack it up to ship it overseas. So what I, had, I really enjoy telling people, there is no indigo in the plant. <laughs> it's a process of converting it into to, from indican and doxol to indigo. And this was a major industry, started in 1740, made a lot of wealth in the low country, but the Revolutionary War ended the indigo, commercial, commercial indigo. The British had given us a, a bounty so we could compete with other areas with the indigo. So once the revolution was over, the British weren't really concerned about helping the poor South Carolina planters, so they did away with the bounty. So indigo after that really could not compete with what you'll see next. So from 1740 to the revolution, indigo was a major process. If you had a plantation, you could have the indigo in the highland and rice on the lowland. So we look next at the next process. So we've got three crops so far, naval stores, silk, and here is the indigo. Three plants so far that made wealth to the low country. And I forgot I had this. There's the indigo vat that came from Red Bank and moved to Otranto. This would be the fermentation vat. There's the beta vat. I guess the um, indigo mud would come out of this little hole down here. Whether they moved the thing in Toto or broke it up in pieces into bricks, I, mean, I, I don't know. But um, that's, that's, that's the only indigo vat that you can actually go and see the process or the, the um, structure. We do have this one in Seven Oaks on John's Island. This is the indigo vat. I think it's being protected now. You can see the color dye along the edge of the bricks here. So there's an indigo vat, probably dating back to the late 1700s, probably, certainly 1800s. So there's um, indigo vat, seven oak plantation on John's Island. I photographed it very recently. And people have done some ex excavation out there. What we have is actually two fermentation vats back to back, and there's the beta vats over here. So the process is, I think, being protected. It's been privately bought by someone else. And I was out there recently, and I will include that in a, another book I'm working on. So now we move to Carolina rice. You know, thank goodness somebody wrote a book on Carolina rice, so I had a book to go to to understand how the process happened. So there's Carolina rice, Richard Bichet and William Judd, and we'll move on. Here's a typical scene in the rice industry. I uh, always like to start with that. Now, I was at um, Mulberry yesterday lecturing on rice. Every time I give a lecture on rice, I simply start out at the beginning. The wealth of the Carolina low country was built on the rice industry. And the rice industry, in part, was built on the backs of enslaved Africans. Simple as that. Without enslaved Africans, there would never, never have been a rice industry. What the low country would look like today, I have no idea. But that's simple as that. And I believe the American Museum, um, African American Museum they're working on now, will hopefully will explain that process as well as it can. So there's a typical scene of the rice kingdom. And when I speak of the rice kingdom, I'm talking about all the way from North Carolina down through Florida. We, the, the industry started in the Cooper River area and spread both directions and went all the way up to Cape Fear, North Carolina, and down to East Florida. Well, that, when I speak of the Rice Kingdom, that's the area I'm talking about. And it went from 1685 roughly to 1911, the Rice Kingdom. Now, where did the first rice stage came from? More than likely, um, the proprietor sent uh, some rice seeds over. 
but also when ships brought slaves over, I saved Africans, they had to have food, so more than likely they had rice. This is a painting showing what we believe is a modern pestle. So the rice, as long as it was not milled, it would, be, it would keep fresh, and then every day they could probably mill some of it and feed the people they were bringing over from Africa. Also, we have, I remember I mentioned a minute ago, 1672, the large proprietors, they sent rice seed over. So somehow some of these enslaved people of the Cooper River um, uh, planters obtained some rice seed. And they began to plant it in what we simply call a floodplain. This is a um, Cooper River area, up tributary of the Cooper River, and they would clear a few trees, plant the rice seed, and lo and behold, it thrived in the low country soil. That first rice was what we call provenance rice. It simply depended on rainfall as a source of, mo source, source of moisture. But the plants survived. And the planters realized, hey, these enslaved people are growing a crop, which we should be able to make a profit out of. So the planters simply appropriated that early slave technology and created what we call the plantation enterprise and enslaved more Africans over here to run and operate the fields. So there is a typical site where we think a type of place that the first rice seeds were planted by slaves, they were using it as food. And there you see a typical scene, black label, white rice. I've got a lecture called Black Label, White Rice, where I talk about the black labor who operated, who's worked the fields, and the white rice that was brought over. But there's a typical scene of enslaved Africans working in a rice field. It was a very arduous task. And I, normally when I give this lecture, if you don't believe that being a slave was a hard life, let me take you to the Sandy Delta in August at noon with no bug spray. I'll give you a shovel, walk up on the bank, and for an hour shovel dirt on that bank, and you realize the conditions that these enslaved people had to work under. So we'll move on from that. Charleston, of course, became one of the richest cities in British North America because mainly from the rice, but also from indigo, but mainly the richness of Charleston came from rice. You try to, I try to myself imagine what we would be right today if rice had not been brought over and enslaved Africans hadn't been brought over. What would this place look like? It's sort of playing mind games. What would Charleston look like? I have no idea. Couldn't even begin to tell you. But because of rice, Charleston became one of the richest cities in British North America. Now, once the first rice was Providence rice, simply depending on rainfall. But somewhere along the line, either enslaved people or the planters realized that if they could control the water flow, they would have a much better chance of bringing a crop to fruition, to control the water flow. So they developed the inland swamp rice fields. And here we go, they simply dammed off a swamp to create a reservoir. Then they dug a canal from the reservoir to an area where they planted the rice. They cleared all the trees, a bank here, a bank here, so they could flood the field. And then when it was time to harvest the crop, they'd simply open a gate in the trunk here and drain the water out. So this was a one-way system from reservoir to the rice field to an adjacent creek. And that was the inland swamp cultivation, and that was the dominant cultivation until the revolution. Now, the main reason they wanted to control the water or have the water supply was it was a way to control weeds. You could plant the rice seed, then you could flood the crop, and the rice seed could germinate anaerobically or underwater. The weedy seeds couldn't. So it was simply a method to control wheat. We didn't have Roundup in those days, so that was the method. That was the main reason they wanted to use the water as weed control. So there's a typical inland swamp rice field of the bluff plantation on the Cooper River. And that was a dominant method of growing rice until the revolution. But <coughs> the main problem with this system was, of course, a drought. You had a drought, you had no rain for the reservoirs. So they wanted to find a more certain supply of water. So they went to the tidal freshwater swamp. Now when I speak of tide, I'm not talking about the salt tide. We're talking about the freshwater tide. Plant, the rice had to have fresh water. Even brackish water will kill it. But all up and down the low country, we had what is called a tidal freshwater swamp. Let me explain that to you. As a river like the Santee comes down from the mountains, it has a lot of fresh water, and it pushes the salt wedge way out. 
Now, when you have, uh, when at low tide, I mean, it pushes the salt wedge out, but when you have a, um, when, when there's not as much fresh, fresh water coming down, then the, the salt tide can actually move up a little bit. But still, all along the low country, we have these, this tidal freshwater marsh that the salt water would come down a river, and if you had the high tide in the harbor, it would call the freshwater to back up. At low tide, the freshwater would drop down. So as the water's coming down the river, and you have the high tide in the harbor, that would cause the freshwater to back up a little, or rise up 30 miles inland. When the salt tide dropped down at low tide, the freshwater had someplace to go, so then it dropped down a little bit. So now you've got what's called high tide, low tide, high tide, low tide. Tidal freshwater swamp that twice a day was flooded and drained of fresh water. And 150,000 acres of tidal freshwater swamp were cleared to make rice fields. An entire ecosystem disappeared from the Carolina Low Country. An entire ecosystem. There's no tidal freshwater marsh left on the coastal area except some of the rice fields which are coming back into swamp forests, so I'll explain in a minute. And here you see the typical process of um, enslaved people making a bank around the, around the marsh, or the swamp should be marsh there, and creating the fields. The outer bank would, of course, keep the, the um, water out of the rice fields till, till it had time to create the individual fields. So 150,000 acres of tidal freshwater swamp were converted to rice fields. Having the bank on the outside here, having that bank, that allowed be able to control the water flow. You had a trunk gate system. You could flood the field when you wanted to, drain it when you wanted to. So now you've got a more certain supply of water. So after the, uh, after the revolution, we converted from the inland swamp system to mainly the tidal system of rice cultivation. And that was the main system until the end of the industry I'll talk about later on. <clears throat> so there you see steps in making rice fields from a tidal freshwater marsh or swamp. And here's the Sandy Delta. It's 10,000 acres of the Sandy Delta. All that was originally a cypress gum swamp. This is the best place I can show people how much the land was changed due to the rice culture. Every little square you see here was a rice field. Every little square you see was a rice field. So 10,000 acres in the Sandy Delta alone were all converted to rice fields starting after the, um, the Revolutionary War. Sandy Delta. And there's the Sandy Delta today. Now, um, of course, it's, it, it, Delta's abandoned now, and nature is ten, starting to reclaim. Right now, we have mostly a, a marsh system out in the Sandy Delta, but that's what the Sandy Delta looks like today. Um, simply all abandoned, but it's still now a wildlife paradise. So there's the Sandy Delta. At one time, it was a swamp, all cleared, abandoned, and now you see what the Santa Delta looks like today. It's a cultural icon. I'll show you why I say that in a minute. And if you don't believe that the Santa Delta was one time a cypress swamp, you can go out at low tide into the creeks and ditches and dikes, and you can see the remains of cypress stumps. Those are the stumps that they simply left there. Maybe they were too big to grub out. So there, the remains of cypress stumps all through the Santa Delta, you know, proof, in other words, that at one time the Santa Delta was a cypress gum swamp. And imagine the labor that went into trying to clear all that land. It just all boggles my mind. And in the Delta, the enslaved people simply lived out in the Delta all their life. This is the remains of a slave. If you saw that article that um, was done in News and Courier about the secret delta, this is the slave village I took Tony out to. Uh, we had to go out there twice trying to find it. But this was a slave village and slave people lived here. There's the bank out here. That kept the water out of the village. You can see the, roof, the, the bricks and so forth where the chimneys were. These enslaved people lived out in that delta probably their entire life. They may have never even gotten to the, to the highland. They could have spent their entire life in that village working those rice fields. You sit and wonder what their life was like. What did, what did they think about sitting in front of the fire at night? Where did they bury the dead? How did they get the food? Did they have any aspirations for the children growing up? All they knew was the rice fields. If they saw a ship out in the ocean, were they tempted to flee? Yet knowing if they got caught, what repercussions would um, prevail? 
it's, it's interesting to, for me to go out there and, and, and take people there and stand them out there and, and think, you're trying to think what the life was like. The Sandy Delta has so much material out there now. There are dozens of slave villages. You, when you look out over the Delta, it looks like it's just enough of a marsh. But you start going out there with people who know it like I do, and you start seeing all these villages, remains of mills, trunk systems. The entire delta was alive at one time. I try to picture myself in a boat going out there, uh, rice chimneys with steam coming out, boats up and down, hauling wives, people in the villages and everything. It was, it was an industry out there, 10,000 acres of homes and slave village homes. It, it gets to me. There's unloading rice bars. You can, you know, they, the rice was collected in the field, taken to the highlands where they did all the processing. Well, that was a typical scene that you would see out in the Santee Delta or any river system. Every river system on the coastline, come here, the Edisto, the Santee, the Waccamaw, all these rivers. Anywhere you had that tidal freshwater swamp, an attempt was made to grow rice. See, an entire, an entire ecosystem, the tidal freshwater swamp, was eliminated. A typical scene of water coloring by Charles, um, Charlotte Drayton Manigove, a rice mill is the water mill, it's a water driven mill, there you see the water wheel there. That would have been a typical scene in the Delta. The chimneys we studied, the rice chimneys were part of the steam processing, processing system. Here's Washoe Reserve, this is owned by the Niche Conservancy. This is a reservoir. If for some reason you had a drought and salt water moved a little too far up the Sandy River. There was so much water coming down the Sandy River, you could grow rice within a quarter of a mile of the ocean. Now something like the Cooper River, which is a coastal river, you don't have that tremendous flow of, of, of fresh water pushing the salt further out, so you had to go maybe 20 miles up the Cooper River before you had fresh water. Every river system was different as far as growing rice. So this is a reservoir called Washoe, if you, these rice fields here needed a supply of fresh water, they simply would flow the water out of the reservoir into the rice field. So that is what Washoe Reserve is, owned by the Nature Conservancy. And there you see these reservoirs are some of the most magnificent habitat we have for wading birds along the coastline, woodstalks and Washoe Reserve. The industry generally ended, the main reason the industry ended was hurricanes, two hurricanes, 1910, 1911, forcing walls of salt water up into the rice fields, killing the crop, breaking the banks. But also, out west they began growing rice out west, and they could use, I think 1869, something like that, they could use machines. Our soil was always too soft to use machines to do the harvesting. Rice in the low country was always harvested by hand, always. But out west they could use these reapers to harvest the rice, which made it much more profitable. Also, Sherman came through in many of the areas in the Savannah area, destroyed a lot of the mills and the infrastructure, and also the slaves were freed, so you lost that free slave labor. But still, we generally use 1910, 1911 as when most of the rice plantations ceased to exist. And that's when many of the northerners came in and bought the plantations, as that's turned out to be very fortuitous, because many of these plantations were given back to the state in the form of wildlife preserves by the northerners. They loved the land so much that they wanted to have it protected. Now we move another book here I can use to talk about CL and cotton. How's our time doing? You can drop that. Okay. You, can, you can edit all, anything you want to out of this. Okay. All right. I'll start again. All right, now we'll talk about Sea Island Cotton. This is a book that Sarah Fick and I did a few years ago, the story of Sea Island Cotton. So I guess I've covered the two major crops, and I'm not sure if I'm going to do the turpentine industry or not. I'll, work, I'll talk about that later on. All right, there are two plants here we want to talk about. This is Gossipium barbadense. This is the plant that the Sea Island Cotton belongs to. So when I speak of barbadense cotton, I'm talking about this plant here. Long staple cotton, black seed cotton. Gossipium hirsutum is the short staple or the green seed cotton. That is the dominant co cotton crop in the world today. Oops. All right, there you see, there's simply a field of upland cotton. This is the dominant cotton. That's what's grown during the Civil War. So there is upland. Now we're not going to talk about upland cotton because upland cotton was ginned by witness gin. That's what fueled 
the slave industry after the Civil War. Upton Cotton was witness gin. We never use witness gin on Sea Island cotton. We never use it on the Sea Island barbarous cotton. We had a different method of ginning. So witness gin was used on the Upton cotton, which is so to speak the cotton of Gone with the Wind, and the main cotton you see grown in the little country today. So we'll forget about Gossipium hirsutum and move to Barbanet's cotton. That plant came into being in the shores somewhere along the coast of Ecuador and Peru. The primitive Barbanet's cotton came into being somewhere along the coast of Peru and Ecuador, so I forgot how many uh, thousands of years ago. So we start our story right there in South America. The plant, the spread of the Gossipian Barbanet's that spread from South America up into the West Indies, all through here. This is the, nat the natural spread of the Barbanet's cotton up into the area of the West Indies. So it, um, by the time Columbus landed, there was this b primitive Barbanet's cotton all through the West Indies. And this is what's going to lead in a minute to the Sea Island cotton. Now, the primitive Barbanet's cotton is an annual, is a, is a perennial plant. There you see in the, in the in West Indies, there is a cotton plant. That is the Barbanet's cotton. It's a tree. Lives year after year after year. But obviously, it gets too tall. How are you going to harvest it? So, and it's also a short day plant. So it's a perennial short day plant in the tropics. Short day, we mean that as the days got shorter and shorter and shorter in the fall, at some point, the day got to a certain point where it triggered the flowering mechanism. And so that happened late in the fall. So you normally, in the tropics, you only had one production of flowers, and of course the fruits where the fiber comes from. Only one production. And that was the dry season, so that's when the seed could be produced. So the primitive barbonet plant was a short day perennial plant. Grew year after year after year like a tree. And there it is again. There is a cotton tree. Now, we brought the plant over and converted it to a day neutral plant. We planted some plants. The winter was not, was a mile. Some of the root systems survived the winter in Georgia. And lo and behold, the next spring, some of the plants started flowering very early. In other words, it didn't wait until the days got shorter and shorter. Latent in the gene pool were some plants that were um, day neutral plants. So they started flowering and every 10 days they produce flowers and fruit. So now we've got a plant that has a long growing season from the spring all the way up to frost. So now you've got the possibility of a commercial crop because you have such a long season the, the flowers and fruits are produced. And there you see a typical, and then what we did, we treated it as an annual, you cut it down every year and plant it the next year. You didn't want it to grow too tall because you couldn't harvest it. So we treated it as an annual, cut it down every year, replanted next year. But the fact that we now have some day neutral plants, you have the opportunity to have flowers and fruits produced two, three months. And that made for a tremendous commercial crop. And oh uh, yeah, so this is Edisto Island, one of the beautiful um, one of the few photographs we have of a Sea Island cotton field, but you can see, even in one year, how tall the plant got. And the, so the first commercial crop of Sea Island cotton was done at Myrtle Bank Plantation on Hilton Head, 1790. 1790 was the first commercial crop of what, we, we, even it's called a Sea Island cotton then, but it wasn't the true Sea Island cotton yet. So Myrtle Bank Plantation on Hilton Head I think Elliot produced the first major crop of long staple Sea Island cotton. And then about 1805, Kindy Burden married Mary Legree, and they moved to Johns Island. This is the River Road. So Kindy Burden moved to there when he married Mary Legree. He began experimenting, and after a few years, he produced the longest fiber ever produced. Some of the fiber was two and a half inches long. He produced the true, fine, very fine, true Sea Island cotton. Kindy Burden, John's Island, Mary Mary Legree, living over there, he produced, we give him credit to seed selection to produce the very long, but once that long staple of fiber was produced by Kindy Burden, virtually every coastal island along the Carolina coast 
was grown in Sea Island cotton. There wasn't a piece of high land anywhere along the coastline, John's Island, James Island, Morgan Island, uh, Ladies Island, Paris Island, Bull Island, every coastal island on the coastline, all the forest was converted to long staple Sea Island cotton, and it became a very major crop of the low country. But everywhere along the coastline you had this sandy soil, it was converted to Sea Island cotton fields. In Edisto Island, here you see Edisto Island in 1853. You could stand on the back of Edisto Island, way at the back of the island, and you could look and you could see the ocean because there was nothing but cotton. Every one of these fields here is a cotton field. The entire Edisto Island was a large cotton field. You could, see, you could stand on the back of the island and see all the way to the ocean, and all you could see was a white mass of Sea Island cotton plants. That's how dominant the crop was. Everything you see in Edisto Island today, if you see a forest on Edisto Island, that's the forest that's grown, that's come in after the industry ended. And Edisto Island produced the, the finest Sea Island cotton. Look at the length of the fiber. That's cotton from, from Edisto Island. The longer the length of the cotton, you'll see in a minute, the better yarn it made. And there's we grew selling cotton on McLeod Foundation recently, sh showing you the leaf and the beautiful flowers. So there's a plant of CL and cotton on McLeod Foundation, James Island. And what we're after, this is the cotton seed. So the flower becomes the seed, and on the surface of the seed are hundreds and hundreds of individual hairs. And that's really the fiber that we're going to weave into cloth. It's on the seed. Our individual hairs are called fiber hairs, so each seed simply has hundreds and hundreds of individual fibers or cells or fiber, we call it, and that's going to be used in a minute to make the yarn. So there's a typical fiber on a typical cotton seed. Remember, every 10 days you've got a whole new set of seeds. That's why it was so important to have a day neutral plant, because you had three months of a growing season. So every 10 days you had another crop of seeds that you could harvest with the fiber. And there you see early on when we milled it, we simply had a roller. And this roller turned this way, that roller turned that way. You put the seed there with the fiber, and the rollers drew the fiber through, and the seed was popped off behind. So early on we used a double crank hand gin to remove the fiber from the seed. Then later on, Cone, Phones McCarthy developed this roller gin, and this is what put the industry in high gear, the Phones McCarthy roller gin. And I'll show you briefly how it operated. Here is the roller. Now the roller is covered with walrus hide, I'll show you in a minute. There's a roller. And the seeds with the fiber on it are pushed down on this board, and the fiber is grabbed by the rough walrus hide, and the fiber is pulled up like this, and you have a knife, but the space between here and the roller is so small, the seed can't pass through. So this blade would come up and hit the seed and pop the seed off. So that way you separated the fiber from the seed with this roller gin, just turned by steam. Seeds passed down. The fiber pulled through this small space. This blade came up, hit the seed, and popped it off from the fiber. So that was the first major method of steam-driven mills to um, remove the fiber from the seed. And there's the walrus hide. They found that walrus hide was so rough that would grab the fiber and pull it through so the knife blade could come up and knock the seed off. Walrus hide, as it, after a long period of time it got so smooth, you had to replace it with more walrus hide. And there's a typical bag of Sea Island cotton, 350 pounds. All of our Sea Island cotton was shipped overseas to London. That's where the money was, London, because that long fiber produced the best cloth in the world and it closed the royalty of England and France. That was the market of the Sea Island cotton, all shipped to Salt House Dock in Liverpool. Now, I'm with, this term is a term, a hank is a length of yard 840 yards long, a hank. Upland cotton, you could produce maybe 30 hanks per pound of cotton. Sea Island cotton, it was so fine, you could produce something like 300 individual hanks for one pound of Sea Island cotton. So you can imagine how much more 
yarn you can make from sea island cotton versus the upland cotton. So three island, sea island cotton, you can produce something like 300 individual hanks for one pound of sea island cotton. And very briefly what you do, the first step, once you've got the fiber, you've got the, what's called carding. You want to lay the fibers sort of parallel. Then you want to draw them out a little bit. You simply draw it out, get it thinner and thinner and thinner, draw it out. Remember, the fibers are so long that they tend to hang together. Then you sort of give them a slight twist, which is called a roving. Very slight twist. Then the last step is to spin it. When you spin it very tight and the fibers are so long, you can spin it so very thin, you can produce such a very thin and strong fiber. So that is very briefly steps in making yarn. And it was 1779 that Compton produced what's called the mule, a type of machine. And that was just about the time that we produced the first crop of sea island cotton, 1790, on Hilton Head Island. So now we've got the machines to make the finest yarn ever known in England. That's why we shipped all of our cotton to England. Here you have the roving. The roving has that slight twist. So what you've got, this is hard to see, but you've got two set of rollers here, a set of rollers here, a set of rollers here. There's a the drafting roller. These rollers here are moving faster than the, the ones on the back. So that tends to pull out and draw out the fiber. So these rollers here are moving faster than these. It tends to draw out the fiber. You want to get it as thin, as thin, as thin as possible. So that's what the rollers do, the drafting rollers. And then this machine here moves on a rail once again, pulling out that fiber thinner and thinner. Remember, the fiber is so long that they overtouch each other, overlap. So that's why you can make such a long, thin, fine yarn. And then, as you're drawing it out more and more, you've got the roll, you've got the, um, roll, the spinner here. That's going to spin it and put the very tight twist in it. So this machine produced the finest yarn ever known. You took the sea island cotton and you could draw it out and twist it so tight that you produced a yarn that could be made into the finest lace ever known. But that was in England, so we shipped all of our cotton to England. And we only have one uh, amount of sea island. This is the only material left of sea island cotton. It was on, um, the Coach Simmons had it. There you see how beautiful the lace was. When I went to England, I thought I'd try to find some gowns over there, material made in sea island cotton. There was nothing. I cannot find anywhere in the country, anywhere, material we know made from sea island cotton. I found some things over there in England, but the, the label said could be made of sea island cotton, so we don't know. So that's probably the only material available that's actually made from sea island cotton. And I've got a photograph of it, lace that was won a prize somewhere. And, but somebody did send me this photograph. I don't know where it came from. Cloth, natural, sea island, finish. So that is sea island cotton. I do not know uh, where the chair is, whether it's still available. But all that beautiful sea island cotton that was made, the material made, it's just all gone. And very rich, remember, produced a lot of wealth in the low country. Prospect Hill and Edisto Island, there's one of the plantations made from the wealth of sea island cotton. Uh, there's a, when the industry, when, when they used up all the highland for fields, they went into the marsh, the salt marsh, and banked the salt marsh off like that, drained it two, three years, rainwater washed all the salt out, and then they grew sea island cotton in the old reclaimed salt marsh. So valuable was the crop. Anywhere you could grow it, you did. So they actually grew it in a salt marsh once, the, once it was banked off, and the water and the salt water drained out. And there's Eddingsville, that's one of the villages. Remember the rice planters who go to the summer village? Eddingsville was a village on the coastline of Edding, um, I, um, Edisto Island. There's Eddingsville and Antivellum Seaside and Resort. Where is it today? Well, I love to go with my class. This is 1851, 1852. And there's the beautiful village of Eddingsville. All the planters, 50 homes, all the planters from Edisto would come in in the summertime, get away from malaria. Well, that entire island is gone. The coastline, there's what's called a thin retreating barrier island, which is all the way over here. So if you don't understand that the coastline is rising, go try to find the village of Eddingsville. It's a quarter of a mile offshore today. You can go up there and scuba dive and go down and see pipes and things sticking out of the water, which are the old, where well, the houses were. So the coastline today is right along here. 
This entire island was washed away, most of it during the hurricane, I think, 1896. It's very unusual. We didn't have fertilizer in those days, so the actor would go out and use pluff mud for the fertilizer. It had these um, walkways made of boards. The um, enslaved people would come out here with a wheelbarrow, come out here, mine this pluff mud, go back and take the pluff mud and put it on the, on the cotton fields. That was the fertilizer up until the fossil industry began in 1689. Mining, sea island, and I won't cover those. All right, the industry ended because of the boll weevil. The boll weevil crossed the Rio Grande down here and spread every year, spread, 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 reached our area in about 1918. Two years later, the industry had ended. <coughs> we could not grow cotton under boll weevil conditions, but you can see how they measured the spread of the boll weevil year by year by year by year until about 1918. You see Charleston here. So that is roughly what killed the Sea Island cotton industry, the boll weevil that spread from Mexico. All right, what we've done is try to cover five crops to show you how it affected the low country of South Carolina. Now, I'm working on another book now. It's a landscape book with Dr. Angela Havaker, and we're going to go through the low country and look at, because anywhere you go in the low country, what you see are cultural and natural sites that man and humans have created ever since 1670. And you go to the Santee Delta, and we'll have a photograph of the Delta, and you look out over the Delta, and you see, we'll tell, tell you in the text, one time it was a swamp forest, all made in rice fields, abandoned, and nature has now reclaimed the Delta in this marsh, marsh community. So what we'll try to do is explain to people where these landscapes came from. But we'll want to go a little further than that. We want to take different people and have them look out on that delta. I'm a son of a, uh, my, my folks were ancestors were rice planters, so I may have a different view of what those rice fields mean. We'll bring in uh, African American who's descended from slaves and have him come and look at those rice fields and see what, what, what they mean to him. We want people to, to talk about what these landscapes mean to each other. So all these landscapes I've talked about today, we'll have different people come out and give their view of what the landscape means to them. If you were a fisherman on a Cooper River, you may have no idea the rice fields there were one time um, uh, swamped and then made into rice fields. Your view would be totally different from mine or somebody else's. So all this material here will be worked into a, what we call a landscape book, which you're working on right now. Faye, thank you very much. I appreciate always coming here. It's always my treat. Thank you.